。各位今日時間嘅朋友，早晨。今日小華法牧師唔單止同我哋分享信息，亦都係今日嘅分享嘉賓，為帶佢分享到佢點樣領受從神而嚟嘅呼召，傳承佢祖父小律柏博士同埋爸爸小安柏牧師權能時間呢個時工。同埋佢點樣樣會以謙卑嘅心靠住神去帶領同埋發展權能時間呢個全球事工，將祝福帶俾唔同年代嘅觀眾朋友。請你繼續支持我哋權能時間呢一、这個勵志電視節目。喺聖經腓立比書第四章第七節，神所賜出人以外的平安，必在基督耶穌裏保守你們的心懷意念。今日，小慧佛牧师总结蒙爱者生命嘅系列信息，主题系不必匆忙，信靠耶稣。我哋好多时候喺日常生活里面都忙忙碌碌，以致我哋好难真正体会到生命里面嘅平安。因为当我哋匆匆忙忙，我哋就唔会有时间去关心身边嘅人，或者照顾我哋嘅身心灵嘅健康。神所赐出人以外的平安，必在基督耶稣里保守你们的心怀意念。小慧彭牧師勸勉我哋珍惜時間，好好同我哋嘅家人相處，同朋友相聚，唔好做時間嘅奴隸。我哋要鬆鬆融融咁去生活，喺神嘅恩典裏邊享受人生。In 1970, a television program debuted that changed the way millions of people looked at faith. The Hour of Power. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Featuring the ministry of Robert Schuller. Taught a generation that through God's love, your scars can be turned into stars. It was an idea that launched the most popular inspirational television program of its time. And today, the Hour of Power continues with a new voice for a new generation. When you put your trust in God, nothing can stop you. Pastor Bobby Shuler will encourage you and share a message that can give you a new perspective on life. Because whatever your circumstance or the obstacles you face, this moment can be your hour of power. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome. We are so honored to have you here. Let us rejoice because the Lord is our provider.、Amen. He is our healer, and He is our victory. Is there anybody here for the first time? Would you raise your hand? If you if you see anybody raising your hand around you, would you turn around and shake their hand? Thank you. I know. Would everybody turn around and shake hands and say, "God loves you," and so do I. Welcome, everyone. We're so glad you're here. We believe that God does want you here. That God has a word for you. That whatever reason you're here, if your tire was flat and you came in here looking for help, I hope you got it and. You know, no matter why, you know, whatever reason you're here, we believe God has a word for you today. Believe it. Open your hearts and allow the Spirit to move. Father, we acknowledge that you are here, your Holy Spirit, the Comforter. We thank you, God, that you are present. We pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would move and encourage and lift up hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
may be seated. In preparation for Bobby's message, the words of our Lord. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. And do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. May we, as God's children, ruthlessly eliminate hurry from our lives. Thank you, choir, and great words from St. Francis of Assisi. Well, today I have a really special honor to be with a dear friend, someone I've known my whole life. Uh, Phil Muncy is, gosh, where do I even begin? Uh, you know, I know Phil from years ago because when my dad and I uh, would walk our dog, we would see Phil all the time. He was a close friend of my dad, and whenever my dad took a day off of church, we still went to church, and we went to Phil's church in Mission Viejo. And I remember going several times. He always honored our family and was uh, dear friends of our whole family, very much influenced, I think, by my grandfather and others. And uh, we had a great encounter on Praise the Lord back in January and reignited our friendship. And it's been just great. He's been a spiritual father and a mentor to me. And uh, just so, so happy to have him here. Would you welcome with me Phil Muncy? Thank you. Phil, hi. Thank you, friend. Good to see you. Well, we're honored to be here, and, yeah. and so it's so exciting. And, Bobby, I thank you for saying that you honor me as a father and a mentor because I'm going to do something uh, that you could be upset if you didn't think I was like a father because okay. I've talked to the producers, and I'm going to actually switch this. Instead of you interviewing me, I think it's time somebody interviews our pastor. What do you think? Okay. <laughs> so, look. Okay. You know, I mean, you know, I, there you go. <laughs> I've been watching you, of course, since you were a young man, but watching the phenomena of what's happening 
sure. with our power. And among the church community, among the secular community, everybody is just amazed at the favor of God that has come upon you and what's happening. Would you have ever thought five years ago you'd be doing what you're doing right now? Well, uh, first of all, this is totally crazy. Thank you for uh, doing it. Uh, yeah, uh, no, five years ago, uh, we were doing Tree of Life, and we were doing a lot of work with the homeless. Uh, when we started that church, we gave, uh, the first year, gave all of our money away. We were able to do that because a guy named Jim Case was able to paint a building that got us to meet there for free, and a number of other serendipitous things happened, and we did not have our eye on doing anything like this. And in fact, I... I would have probably really resisted if the Lord had told me to start a TV ministry. It just wouldn't have been something that would have crossed my mind. I would have started an internet ministry yeah. and, uh, or a podcast or something like that. And so having been called into this role, it's, I've actually learned the power of television. Um, I love it. It's been a lot of fun. And uh, there's been a learning curve, but it's been amazing doing that and, and at the same time shepherding this church, which has been a tremendous honor and a real, real privilege uh, to be the pastor of, of this, this church. What did you yeah. have to overcome in your mind to go from, first of all, this was expected. Yeah. And when you're young and people say, you're probably going to be like your dad, you're going to be like your grandfather, that's yeah. a little. And then you come from a generation that's somewhat cynical. Yeah. How did you have to get over those barriers to be comfortable with where you are now? Well, I think, I think one of the big challenges, first of all, coming into this church, friends, was, I mean, just my age, you know, just that I'm so young, and can I, can I shepherd a church who, filled with people my parents' age and my grandparents' age? And can I have real spiritual authority uh, in that community? And then to have little, I mean, I had some experience in television, but not in production or anything like that. Can I, you know, so I didn't feel qualified, um, and that's why... I sort of had, I think, to get sucked into this. is just kind of pulpit filling, and then like, well, what is my role here, and what am I going to do long term? And, and so I think it really, you know, it just took the Holy Spirit doing yeah. what he does. There was something you said that I wanted to say in my interview of you today, <laughs> uh, which was when I was at TBN, there was, a, there was an experience where I was wrestling with some of these things, and Phil was interviewing me, and he said something like... Um, we were talking about blessing the next generation. And he said, fathers need to bless sons, not as sons, as they always have, but he needs to bless sons as fathers. And then he said, I bless you, not as a son, but as a spiritual father, mm. to, to step into that role to become a spiritual. And I actually felt something almost break in my spirit mm. when he said that it was it really moved in me. And since then, January of this year, almost a year ago, it's an amazing, amount of things have happened, not only my perspective of how to lead the church, but I think just even spiritually something big happened there for us. And I think we're all seeing that. I think we're seeing this amazing. To me, Bobby, when I look at you, I see this uh, effusion again of, of uh, you're very intellectual, you're very smart, you're very scholarly, your approach to the scriptures. Uh, you have become a spiritual father, though you are young, mm -hmm. because you're the first voice on television it's pretty typical to see younger pastors attracting younger audiences, yeah. older pastors attracting older audience. You're the first to ever attract both, to bring back to the table a cynical mm, yeah. generation yeah. and an older mature audience that's been there and done that and can't be fooled. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you have really done that. And this is a phenomenal. To me, mm -hmm. I think we're seeing history. That's why I told the producers, I got nothing to say. You're the guy that people <laughs> want to know about yeah. because this is an oh, amazing thing. Uh, what has been the most uh, shocking or most surprising thing that has been happening in the last three years since you've been over our power? That's the most shocking thing what you just said. <laughs> really, that's it. You say, I know what I'm talking about. I'm not so sure. I, I, I mean, I, I, that's, that's just it. I mean, the, the, the fact is, it's not even just the older people that we, that we attract, but these are business owners. These are community leaders. These are professors. And uh, many of you have had or still have tremendous careers, have been movers and shakers in the world. Um, I just felt like I should be obedient to God, and, and I, I just feel very, very humble, really humbled um, at the idea that, um, you know, that this church would, 
would embrace me as a pastor. It really has meant the world, and, and um, I, I love being here, and I, I love this church, with, really, with all my heart. And I don't know. I, I, think, I think a big part of, I think a big part of um, trying to reach both has a lot to do with just being myself. Yes. You know, I think it was, I had a friend, Rich Watts, that said, never lose your pokey parts or something like that. <laughs> it was like, always be you. Don't ever, don't ever try and be refined and, and look like someone else. Just be Bobby, and that's, that's what I've tried to do, so... Well, you're really blazing a trail because you're showing a pattern of that this can work. Yeah. Um, uh, often we get a sense in our culture that uh, we, we hear about wars of nations against nation, but there's a subtle war between generations and generations. Mm. And that's part of what I saw when I interviewed you, mm. that God was going to use you to, to really become a father yeah. uh, even though you were young because it's not really an age thing. It's a gifting. It's a calling. And uh, I think it is remarkable to this congregation and to the millions of viewers that they have seen you, not just as a son mm -hmm. or a grandson, but that you have stepped into your own calling. And you are now fathering a generation uh, with spiritual insight and wisdom. Uh, how do you feel about, though, you, you seem comfortable in embracing the legacy that you have. I sure, mean, of course. You know, you, it, it, it comes out of you. It, it's... It's very easy to see your father and your grandfather coming out of you. And it's actually yeah. quite fun. Well, well look, look, all these sweet things you're saying about me, and it's hard for me not to feel like I just got lucky. I mean, I got a good hand, you know? Like, people get to... And I'm, I know we don't believe or endorse luck. I believe it was God's providence, but it's not like I'm this, like, great, strategic... You know, really, it's a lot of it's just having the right team, you know? Uh, guys like... Uh, Russ and Chad and Don Nguyen and, and Mark and, and different leaders, Glenn, and all, all the many leaders in this church that are doing their various things that just, it was already working. It, all those things were already happening. And so I, I think, I don't know, I, I, I just, uh, I feel very, very lucky. It's, uh, and uh, and um, so what was your question? How do I feel about what now? <laughs> No, I, I, I think that you have become comfortable in the fact that, yeah. you know, a lot of people your age uh, are either resisting their yeah. legacy and yes. their equity. So my, yeah, so, and so you seem to have come to peace with letting yeah. your father, your mother, your, your grandfather, it, it flows and comes out of you and you seem yeah. to be at peace and you're not fighting it. No, well, like my dad was, was the chief here and he and I still talk all the time. He's not here today, but he's very often here in the audience and we'll go to Whole Foods afterwards and we'll, talk, we'll get lunch and we'll talk about things. And I used to have that relationship with my grandfather before he passed and you know, in fact, my dad, grandpa, and I would get together all the time. And every Thursday, in fact, when I was at, at the Crusoe Cathedral, my grandpa would meet with me for hours. And he would, he would, you know, bump everyone else and keep hanging out with me. And, um, and he really invested in Hannah and I. And, uh, and, and so I, I just, so much of who I am is because of my parents and my grandparents. And not just them, my grandma, grandpa, personally, and my mom, and my, my step parent. I mean, there's just been... Yeah. I'm, I am who I am because of my gran my grandma and grandpa and because of my yeah. my dad. So for yeah. me, it would be uncomfortable not to to pretend like, well, I just yeah. came up with this stuff, you know. Well, you've, you've embraced it, and I think it's great. You're giving us an example to your generation to not resist, not to fight, but to embrace yeah. uh, everything that's come through. And I just want to go on record saying I love your family. I love you. I love your heart. What I love about you um, you're a phenomenal speaker and teacher, uh, but you're a greater Christian. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what I love most about you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And I just want and so many pastors that are cheering for you. Uh, we are watching you. Pastors are, if you're a business person, you're watching the stock market. Well, pastors watch pastors. <laughs> we spy on each other. And I can tell you people are talking good behind your back. They're talking good behind this congregation. Yeah. We're all saying this is a phenomenal. We're so thrilled. And I just want to say uh, to our audience, uh, on behalf of so many of us that know uh, what's going on behind the scene, be a part of this phenomenon. You know, if you're younger and you're a millennialist that you're often called in your 30s, and you would say, man, I've, I, I've never supported anybody on Christian TV. That's the last thing I would ever do. You know what? Consider, now that you've found a voice that reflects uh, your understanding of God, someone who's intelligent but also who's sincere, 
do that. Reach out and say, you know what? I'm going to support something that's pure and that's something good. And those of you that are older and you've been faithful over the years, this is your chance to do the greatest thing you could ever do, and that is support the next generation. Don't just treat them like sons, but treat them like the fathers they have now become. And in doing so, not only will you be honored, but you'll honor a ministry that I think, Bobby, I can just tell you, I just beam. When I watch you preach, when I watch the hour of power, man, there's a lot of times I get up off my seat because I got Pentecostal roots. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah! But uh, we love you, we're proud of you, and let me tell you something, your best days are ahead. Thank you. You believe Phil. that? Thank you. Thank you for letting me do this. <laughs> Thanks, Mel. I appreciate it.
Wow, thank you, Bridget Bentley. Worship, man, that was good. Always nice. Well, thank you for being here today. We believe that God's called you here for a reason. For all of you watching on TV, stay tuned. We think God has a word for you. We believe it. This is a community of joy. There are people here that want to help you, come alongside you, no matter where you are in your life. This is a place where you belong before you believe. And if you're on Twitter, reach out to me. I respond to everyone at least once on Twitter, because I love Twitter. All right, would you stand with me? And we're going to say this confession together. We're talking about it today, so really listen. Hold your hands out like this as a sign of receiving. Take a deep breath. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. If you believe it, say amen. Amen. So if you come to, to church today and you feel as though you're very, very busy, always going from one thing to another, perhaps you feel like in your life with all the work you do, you sometimes would say, I feel a bit numb. Like it's hard to experience the normal pleasures of life. Maybe today you rushed and hurried on your way to church and so you've arrived just a little frazzled. Someone take your parking spot. No matter who you are, if you feel busy, hurried, rushed, worried, anxious, not enough sleep, going from one thing to another, God has a word for you today. And the word is this. You don't have to prove yourself to anyone You are loved by God. You are loved by God. And there's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can achieve that will increase that. There's no mistake you can make that will decrease that. God loves you. And that's very good news, isn't it? You don't need to hurry because you don't need to prove anything to anyone. Many of us oftentimes ruin the joy that we could have in our lives because we're impatient. Impatience is one of the world's biggest happiness killers. We're constantly going, moving, moving, moving. And so because of that, few of us truly experience joy in our lives. And that's no good. We're going to have slow, great lives as disciples who will walk in God's easy rhythms of grace. Thought I'd just say it slowly. (laughs) See? So I want to begin by asking you this question. What comes to mind when you think of clocks? What do you think of when you think of clocks? How do you feel? Clocks drum up a number of weird emotions, especially on the type of clock it is. Stand-up clocks that are antiques, create very different feelings than the box clocks with digits in them. No matter who you are, though, it's likely that the image of a clock is a symbol of your life wasting away. It's one second closer to the grave. Many of us very much associate Father Time with, you know, the Grim Reaper himself. Clocks are a symbol of having to be productive and busy and to be somewhere and And I just want to talk about that. Did you know the clock, the mechanical clock, was originally invented by Benedictine monks to remind them to stop working and to stop and pray? Now, up until then, there were many types of clocks. There were water clocks and sand clocks and and, uh, sundials and things like that. But the, the Benedictine monks believed that time was a sacred thing held in God's hands that could be life-giving but also very dangerous, and so it had to be respected. And so their way of respecting time was to invent a mechanical clock that was exactly precise. And they called it a clock. It comes from the French word that means a bell, so that these bells would ring, church bells, telling the monks, stop, stop working, and pray. For them, time was meant to be valued not to hurry, but to stop. 
And so the irony of the invention of the mechanical clock is that the monks wanted it to be a way in which people would remember to stop working and start praying seven times a day. By the 14th century, some German prince took this mechanical clock, put it on a tower, and decided that if people could measure their productivity by time, well, they would be a lot more productive, productive and he was right. But what, what, what's the result of that? There's an author named Lewis Mumford who says the result of that is this, that clocks have moved us away from understanding the normal natural rhythms of the world and have put us into a new illusion that all of existence is moment to moment. Like chapters of a book, we go from one thing to the next thing to the next thing and they're all measured in increments of time. And so that view of moment to moment has diverted us from a true deep sense of sacredness for things like the sun and the seasons. They become less relative as everything becomes a measurement of time. And he calls it this, he says, the mechanical clock is a piece of power machinery whose product is seconds and minutes. We have gone from being time savers to being time servers. And I would argue that we've become time slavers that we have become slaves to the clock, and we feel it. I never want to say to my wife, honey, it's 2307, it's time to go to bed. <laughs> there is something about clocks that gnaws at us, because what it is, is a reflection that time itself is a commodity being wasted. So where is there time for rest? Well, I have exactly one hour of rest. <laughs> See, that's what's happening in our bodies. And the clock truly is, I think, a gift from God, but it's dangerous. It's dangerous if we don't rule over it. If it rules over us, and for many of us it does, it becomes dangerous. Especially the alarm clock. Don't even get me started. <laughs> How many of you, before you go to bed, you pull out your alarm clock and you do the math of exactly how much sleep I'm going to get tonight. I'm going to get seven hours and 24 minutes of sleep. Unless I hit the snooze button, then it'll be bumped up to seven hours and 30. Never mind. <laughs> My brother used to have this alarm clock that it was like a voice of a fisherman. Hey, hey, wake up. It was like in the shape of a reel. <laughs> wake up. And this sound drove him crazy because he got so used to waking up to it as an alarm. I have the same thing. There is this thing that's an alarm, and whenever I hear it, I used to use it as my alarm to wake up in the morning, and now whenever I hear it, when people use it, it always makes me cringe. It sounds like this. <laughs> Ugh. Anybody have that feeling? So think about all those feelings, right? All these things that you think of that are related to alarm clocks and work clocks, all of these things are related to a way in which you're living life, and you don't have to feel that way about clocks. Clocks work for you. You don't work for clocks. Can we just say that? We say that out loud? Clocks work for you. You don't work for clocks. What if we believed that? <laughs> Imagine how much happier we'd be, how much more loving we would be, and how much more in tune we would be with the natural, easy yoke of Jesus, which is slow, which is compassionate, which is interruptible. We are hurried. We're hurried when we drive. We're hurried when we eat. We're hurried when we pay and fumble our money at Starbucks because we don't want the person behind us to have an extra 10 seconds. We rush. How many times have, have you seen someone, I love it when I'm driving nice and slow, and someone's like, Foof, and then they stop at the stoplight and I'm still moving and it turns green and I just go right by them, you know? <laughs> <laughs> we freak out when an internet page takes more than three seconds to load. And all of this we do with the idea that we're saving time, but we're not saving time, we're serving time. Like in a prison, you are serving time. <laughs> and it's time to stop.
Now, you can be responsible, you ought to be on time, but this whole idea that my whole life is ruled by a clock, that I have to hurry, that I have to rush, that time is a commodity that needs to be saved, that needs to be served, it's over. Stop doing it. It's time to start to stop worrying and trust one simple thing, that this life will end, and it will end very quickly if you hurry through it, and you will not savor it or enjoy it or live to your full calling if you are constantly worried and hurried. It's time to relax and enjoy your life even when you work hard. We carry worry in our bodies. We wake up hurried. We go to bed hurried. We do our work hurried. And this is a feeling. It's an emotion that exists in our bodies. And it's ruining our joy and it's ruining our compassion. Not only as Christians, but as people in general. The modern world is addicted to speed. And I don't mean the drug speed. I mean the drug speed. (laughs) Speeding. I mean hurrying. I mean adrenaline. We are so driven, going, 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 doing, 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 that we never stop and enjoy the very simple things, which are the best things that God has given us. It's time to stop hurrying. You cannot be hurried and be kind. You cannot be hurried and be happy. These are the two points I want to make today. First, you cannot be hurried and be kind or loving. I want to begin with Jesus, the ultimate example. Think about how interruptible Jesus was. Almost every miracle story is someone interrupting Jesus when he's on his way to go somewhere. The leper shouts out, Lord, have mercy on me. And Jesus stops and walks all the way over to where the leper is and he heals him. The bleeding woman, you know, Jesus is on his way to, I think it was Jairus' daughter, and he's He's on his way to to help this person, but a bleeding woman stops and is healed by him. And he takes a moment and he talks to her. Almost every single person that was healed or helped by Jesus interrupted him. Do you know why? Because Jesus was relaxed. Jesus was relaxed. Jesus was not in a hurry. He knew he was a ceaseless spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's good universe. Just like you. And he knew that if he hurried, he might miss out on the needs of people around him. He knew what you should know, and that is you cannot be both in a hurry and be kind. If you're in a hurry and someone stops you and needs prayer or needs a listening ear, even if you stop and meet with them but you feel hurry in your body, you're still not going to be at a place where you can truly be a representation of Christ to them. You cannot be in a hurry and be loving to others. This is why 1 Corinthians, the first thing when it starts to describe love, what's the first word? Love is patient. The dictionary term for patient is able to accept or tolerate delays, problems, or suffering without becoming annoyed or anxious. Are you patient? Are you patient? Are you able to tolerate problems, suffering, or delays without becoming annoyed or anxious? If you can't do that, you can't be loving. Because love is patient. Love is unhurried. Love is present. Love is not regretting yesterday. Love is not thinking about the next thing. Love is not focusing on tomorrow. Love is not trying to use this moment to get something for myself or to be more to, to get some kind of achievement or, or reach a goal. Love is simply being present and caring. Love is patient. Love is unhurried. And so many of us, our relationships are eroding because of hurry. We wonder why things aren't going well with our kids or our spouse or our parents or our colleagues or the people that used to be our friends very often. It's because whenever you're with them, you're not really with them. You're hurried. You're thinking about getting to the next thing. You cannot be hurried and be loving at the same time. You have to be slow. You have to be relaxed. And then loving people will be easy. It'll be like eating chocolate cake. It's just easy. Because you are relaxed. Amen? Amen. 
That is why the second thing is true, that you also can't be hurried and be happy. Because if you're hurried all the time, your relationships will be suffering. Many of your relationships will be an illusion. You'll be tricking yourself into thinking everything is going great. And you're able to hide it because you're always in a hurry getting to the next thing. So if you are in a hurry all the time, your relationships are suffering because of it. And you'll find very quickly that your relationships will pr improve if you can make, reduce the clutter in your life and become more present and become an interruptible, loving, patient person. So the second thing is that you cannot be hurried and be happy. Isn't that sad? But I've got so much to do. God did not clutter your life. God did not clutter your life. There are times in our lives where we have a lot to do and we're busy, but you know, you can even work hard and do a lot and even overwork without being hurried. You can be really effective at your job and you can actually work long hours and never be hurried. And you'll likely be more productive, even though that's not what we're looking for. <laughs> What we're looking for is loving disciples who are unhurried and happy disciples. Impatience is the number one happiness killer, I think, in America and the West today. We're not willing to wait to, to see the seeds that we've planted grow. We're not willing to wait and till them. We're not willing to wait and see what happens in a relationship. Impatience leads to so much unhappiness. And yet we find ourselves hurrying. Now, yes, there are times when we ought to hurry. There's one time when Jesus tells us to hurry. Do you know what it is? Do you remember? He says, settle matters quickly with your adversary. That's the one thing he tells us to hurry, is to settle things, settle conflict, to hurry and bring peace. You know, there are some legitimate times when you can hurry, okay? If you are being chased by a lion, <laughs> hurry. All right? If you need to get out of a burning building, hurry. <laughs> if someone needs you to rescue them, hurry. Heroes hurry. But don't use that same adrenaline that you need to outrun a lion to get out of a burning building or rescue someone from the water. Don't use that to check your emails. <laughs> okay? Don't use adrenaline to somehow think that you're going to get through the five faster. You're not. You're just not. If you go slow in the right lane or really fast in the left lane, you might get an extra 15 seconds between here and there, which you're only going to use on your Facebook page. <laughs> no reason to hurry. Arch Hart is a psychologist at Fuller where I went to school, and he wrote a wonderful book called Thrilled to Death about anhedonia. Anhedonia is a medical condition that's reached all-time highs in America and parts of the West. Anhedonia is not like depression. It's different than depression because anhedonia is a chemical imbalance in your brain which makes it impossible for you to experience pleasure. Anhedonia comes because of overstimulation. It comes because you're hurrying, because you're nailing your adrenal gland over and over with coffee, hurrying, stress, and especially flashing screens. And so many of us, we live through life constantly engaging this adrenal gland and that releases dopamine in our brain so that our body can't naturally release dopamine. That is the thing that makes us feel genuine pleasure when we're having a walk through the woods. So we do that kind of thing and we think, this used to be great to me. I used to love sitting with a, with a cup of tea by the fire and, you know, reading Pride and Prejudice. I love doing that. Just kidding, I don't. But <laughs> what, I, I used to love these simple pleasures in life. These very, and they, I don't like them and they don't bring pleasure like they used to. Well, you might be anhedonic. You might be hurrying so much, checking emails so much, watching so much TV, listening to so much loud music going from point A to point B in a hurry, always carrying hurry in your body, even when you sleep, that your adrenal gland is so worn out that your body physically can't develop the chemicals anymore that reflect pleasure in your soul. You've beat yourself up too much. You haven't cared for your body or your soul. Anhedonia is the result of us, I think, trying to plow through the difficult experiences in life. And life is hard. 
But very often it's like we get to these hard times in our lives and we're just going to hurry through them. We're not going to listen to God, nor will we walk with him. We will run through this so that we can get to the next party. We will not navigate slowly through the painful parts, the suffering in our lives. We won't dwell there because it's too painful. Instead, we'll just go watch TV or play video games or be in a hurry or get busy doing something else other than being present even in our sufferings. And what that does is it causes your life to fly by in an instant. And it causes you to feel anhedonic. It causes you to be unpresent and it erodes your relationships and your happiness. There's a fairy story called, uh, I think it was Boy in the Silver Ball. I think it's Russian. I don't really know. But there's a story about this boy, and, and the boy is very impatient. And he's always hating a school, and a fairy appears to him. And she gives him this ball that has a little golden string hanging from it. And she says, here's the string, and the string is your life. And if you're ever at something in your life that you want to get through quickly, just pull on the string a little bit and you'll fast forward through that event magically. And so what he does is every time he has suffering in his life, he pulls the string and sometimes he pulls it harder. And within what it feels like simply days, he's already an old man. And the poor, poor boy goes to the, fairies, the fairy and he says, I've ruined my whole life because I've rushed through all the suffering. And she said, if you could have one wish, what would you want? He said, I would wish that I could go back and suffer slowly. I wish I could go back and experience not just the good parts of life, but the bad parts too, and not hurry through it, and not distract myself, and not always run to other things. And I would say to you, friends, that sometimes when we're going through the hardest things in our life, that is when God shines the most. That is when we feel the love of our family and friends the most. Why would you hurry through something like that? Yes, it's painful, but some of the best things in life are painful. They, they come to us you know, because they're painful sometimes, that the, the character that's developed by not hurrying through the hard things in life, the character that forms in your soul will, will in the long run make you a more fulfilled, loving, spiritually fruitful person. God is with you even through those challenges. He's with you. So all of this to say, wherever you are in your life, ruthlessly eliminate hurry. From your life. Ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life so that you can be a more loving and a happier person. It's what God wants for you. Jesus was relaxed. We should be relaxed. I'll end on this last thought. The book of Hebrews, the author tells a story about the Jewish people. And he said that when they were going through the wilderness, they disobeyed God. And God's curse on them was this. They shall never enter my rest. The curse, the reward they missed out on, said they, because I'm angry with them, they shall never enter my rest. And then the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 1, he says, the promise of entering God's rest still stands. It's still available to us. That this great reward that we can live in God's rest is a real thing. That you can work hard, that you can suffer, that you can still get up with an alarm clock and still go to bed late and still be at rest, centered. If you want to walk with God, you must walk with him at a walking pace. Can I get an amen? amen. It is the truth. In Christianity, Sunday is not the last day of the week. It's the first day of the week. Sunday's the first day. So that you begin the week with a day off, a day to rest, a day to be with your family, and a day to worship. So that you don't work and suffer for a whole week and then get this little reward called a weekend, right? But rather, Sunday becomes a time of preparing your soul in a place of holiness and rest. So that when you leave Sundays, you sort of carry it with you. That wherever you go, you experience God's Holy Spirit walking with you, speaking to you. You become interruptible. You become present. You become the one that people feel like they can talk to because they know that you're not too busy to stop and just listen. What if we could all be like that? What if we could all eliminate hurry from our lives? So I want to encourage you to do two things. One, I want you to employ uh, an old monastic rule called stachio. 
Everybody say pistachio. It's like pistachio without the puh. Pistachio is the idea that when I'm supposed to be somewhere, I'm going to get there early so I can pray first. So if you have a meeting at 6, try and get there at 5.50. But I'll lose 10 minutes. <laughs> See, isn't that how we think? Get rid of that, please. Get there at 5.50. And if you're there at 5.50, and you may not be, take 10 minutes to prepare your heart for the person you're about to meet. How different would your life be if every time you had a meeting with a loved one or a colleague or a client, if you got there early and you sat in your car for 10 minutes and you invited the Holy Spirit to be in this event you're about to have, imagine how different every experience would be. You'd enter in more receptive, you'd be more listening, you'd be less angry, and you know what? You'd be smarter. You'd go in with many more tools to succeed in whatever it is you want to do. So first, think about employing stachio into the rhythms of your life. Second, I want you to do this. When, you, when you're driving, when you stop, I want you to really stop. Bill Galtier does this. Sometimes when he stops at a stoplight, he stops full on and he says, Lord, thank you for stopping me. Lord, thank you for stopping me. What a great prayer that is. Isn't that great? The idea that, Lord, no matter where I'm going, no matter what I need to do, no matter what I need to achieve, I am interruptible by you. Speak to me, use me, I'm listening. All right, friends, let's pray. Father, we invite your Holy Spirit to interrupt us whenever you must. I pray, God, that you would form in us the idea that we no longer need to hurry, we don't need to worry, we can trust you with our lives and share your love with the world. Lord, we don't want to be like the kid who pulls the string on the ball. We don't want to get to the end of our lives and say, it went, it went by so fast because I was always so hurried. Lord, with whatever time we have left, we give it to you slowly. Slowly. Build patience into our heart and help us to be unhurried and present with you and with the people who love us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for being here today. We believe that God will bless you on your way out, that you'll carry with you a deep sense of his spirit, and that you'll go into this week rested, recharged, renewed, and ready to take on a new week for God. Are you ready? Yes. Then the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Join us again next week as Pastor Bobby Schuler brings you a message of hope on the Hour of Power. And Pastor Bobby would love to hear from you. Just write us. And we Until next week, remember to let your hopes, not your hurts, shape your future.我們很多時候在日常生活中都忙忙碌碌以致我們很難真正體會到生命裡面的平安同朋友相聚不要做時間的奴隸我們要鬆鬆融融地去生活在神的恩典裏享受人生神所賜出人以外的平安必在基督耶穌裏保守你們的心懷意念神愛你我們下個禮拜再見